Hi everybody, this is a tutorial for the Year 4 Acute Medicine students uh, doing their Acute Medicine module. My name is James Piper, I'm a Senior Clinical Teaching Fellow in Acute Medicine at the Royal Free Hospital. Some of you will have already had this tutorial before, however I have redrafted it um, and added in some extra slides. I hope you find this tutorial useful. Of course if there are any queries about its content, please don't hesitate to email me at james.piper at ucl.ac.uk. First of all, I'd like to introduce you to the Acute Medicine Unit as the centre of the universe. Uh, by specialty, we are very diverse, um, and we take referrals, as you can see from this diagram, from general practice, those who are referred from the emergency department, those who are part of our ambulatory care system, um, and obviously with after that, once they are assessed and stabilised on the Acute Medicine Unit, a lot of our patients are discharged home. It may be that we will see them in our follow-up clinic, or they'll go into a specialty ward such as gastroenterology, uh, cardiology. Unfortunately, if our patients become more poorly, they may be reviewed by medics and referred on to my colleagues in intensive care. Uh, the uniquely at the Royal Free, we do accept step-down patients from the intensive care unit. The acute medicine unit uh, is a rather unique setup um, as we have our uh, own uh, often divided areas such as a monitoring area which we have this is otherwise known as a higher dependency area uh, so for example patients will have continuous cardiac monitoring we also often have a short stay unit or otherwise known as acute assessment units uh, on the diagram where it says TOC this stands for transfer of care and this is where a patient may be transferred to a specialty service um, such as gastroenterology or cardiology as I was saying before It's really important to think about the principles that underpin acute medicine and this is well represented by the chain of survival. This may be familiar to you from uh, the Resuscitation Council uh, website and also uh, of course my talk on the advanced life support uh, algorithm for non-COVID patients but these are the fundamental principles of acute medicine particularly the first two. The most important thing of course is that we understand and recognize an acutely unwell patient and this is a skill that I would strongly encourage you to develop particularly from now until your finals and of course into your postgraduate training. Recognizing someone who's poorly is actually trickier than you might think and I'll show you some examples as to why that might be in a few slides time. It's important for all of us in acute medicine to try and work to prevent cardiac arrest and here decision making one of the uh, key attributes of an acute physician that and leadership is to make decisions about whether these people uh, should be resuscitated or not whether we escalate them early whether they have ward-based care and so on if unfortunately they have uh, a survivor uh, if unfortunately they have a cardiac arrest then it's important that uh, we give chest compressions and defibrillate them however you'll find that in the hospital setting uh, the vast majority of patients are not defibrillatable. They have what we call non-shockable rhythms or PEA and therefore often that's why uh, they don't survive cardiac arrest and unfortunately despite rapid advances in medical treatment the cardiac arrest survival rate um, for uh, in-hospital cardiac arrest remains stubbornly low at 10%. We also have to think about whether we're going to escalate our patients or not and given the current COVID-19 epidemic, this is something that really has been thrust into uh, the front of everybody's minds, not just those who work in acute medicine. It may well be that a patient uh, has multiple comorbidities, uh, unfortunately will not survive despite uh, our best efforts, and therefore it may be that the best treatment for them is to palliate them. Or it may be that they have potential reversible organ failure, so for example a severe pneumonia in a young adult who's otherwise fit and well, and we may escalate them up to critical care. This slide demonstrates ni neatly what I've just been talking about, and you can see the stark difference between those who have a ventricular fibrillation or pulseless VT arrests versus non-VF and pulseless VT. There are a couple of important things to note here, and that is the, the percentage different terms in the frequency of the type of rest. So as you can see, the ventricular fibrillation or pulses VT arrest only account for about 16% of that data set. 
it's a relatively old data set I believe from 2015 but I don't as far as I'm aware the numbers haven't significantly changed since the last data set however what you will notice is that the survival to hospital discharge is as high as 49 percent and actually when we factor in modern community changes such as AEDs in uh, shopping malls uh, football pitches uh, and in supermarkets then actually it may well be that we can push to a much higher percentage survival uh, some papers do quote as high as 90 percent survival with an AED on scene however conversely in the non VF or pulseless VT range otherwise known as PEA which are the substantial majority of cardiac arrests uh, 84 percent you can see the survival to hospital discharge as as low as uh, 11 percent overall the survival of cardiac arrest in both categories is only 17 percent another chain for you don't need to know this off the top of your head but again these are some of the fundamental principles uh, that apply to uh, us in acute medicine education hence this uh, talk monitoring is something that's often very well nurse led and often done very well we use the new score as a framework to help us do that but remember that the new score framework which I'll come on to in a moment is just that it's a framework and a scoring system it should never supplement clinical judgment you'll find that as you go around your rotations uh, in your trust that you'll find that patients are monitored to a very different degree so for example on say stroke rehabilitation ward uh, it may only be that the patients have their blood pressure and pulse and temperature monitored once a day in theatre however where the patients are under general anaesthesia then actually they're being constantly monitored uh, non-invasively and sometimes even invasively where some patients on who are having a large case such as a laparotomy for example will have arterial lines put in recognizing someone who is poorly uh, does depend a lot on the extreme of, uh, of age of the patient I'll come to this again shortly calling for help so recognizing that uh, and knowing the double T double T system and uh, being able to escalate to the medical emergency team uh, for example we're here at the Royal Free we have the part team which is stands for uh, patient at risk and resuscitation team which is comprised of very senior nurses who have ITU and a &E experience I want you to think about now about what uh, a sick patient looks like to you uh, and it's a good idea I would suggest that by the time you graduate to have an idea in your mind about what one looks like how do you know when you arrive at a bedside whether you've got a patient who needs urgent senior input uh, an early decision making or someone where I say relax you've got a bit of time to read the notes check the investigations do a full examination and then make some decisions so the patient that we have in front of us well he d might not look sick in that he doesn't seem to have any IV fluids he's not in any oxygen he's got n uh, no um, monitoring on but he as you can see he looks very frail he has tissue paper skin he's got pock marks at the top of his head he has wasting of the frontalis muscles small wasting of the hands so although he might not be acutely sick actually he's sick in the sense that he's clearly someone very vulnerable and very at risk of deterioration now in this second picture here uh, this patient who looks rather uh, well and has a nice collection of flowers behind him um, isn't what we would call typically sick uh, again he has no monitoring he has uh, good color uh, well perfused um, obviously not got any uh, marked signs of distress apart from that thermometer however it's important again to be able to think laterally about these patients is it that he's in bed because he has a significant headache is he has he got his eyes closed because he's photophobic and actually has meningitis is it that he's in bed and has had uh, a significant headache for a number of weeks and actually uh, on CT scanning he has a space occupying lesion unfortunately anecdotally sometimes a lot of these patients around my age who present with headaches often have uh, space occupying lesions I think this is probably uh, a more typical picture of what we would consider um, a sick patient there's obviously a resuscitation team the patient's obviously in some sort of trauma or high dependency bed the patient has monitoring on there's a whole team um, of there including nurses doctors um, anesthetists and so on 
you can see the patients having uh, got uh, a non rebreather mask on, a BP cuff on, three lead monitoring, uh, and obviously he's being looked after by a medical emergency team. So this is a more classic image of what we describe as a sick patient. Well, so this uh, picture here, as you can see, the patient's on chemotherapy. Now, what we don't know, of course, from this picture is uh, whether they are on uh, their first cycle or their last, and whether they're palliative or whether they're curative. But, of course, what, what we do know about chemo, for example, and especially some of these newer immune therapies, is it does make them much sicker, does make them much more vulnerable uh, to neutropenic sepsis, for example, and more atypical infections such as CMV, uh, VZV, uh, and other types of atypical infections such as fungus. I think we'd probably all agree that this patient looks very sick. However, what we clearly aren't going to do uh, in this case is escalate this patient's treatment. Either this patient is in a hospice or in a palliative care bed uh, and is clearly dying. So yes, although they look sick, clearly we're not going to be uh, resuscitating that patient or doing chest compressions. Obviously, if a patient has an end-stage terminal diagnosis, an intervention like that would be wholly inappropriate. So one of the key attributes in acute medicine is detecting deterioration and getting a good clear history of what's been happening to the patient prior to deterioration. Uh, forgive me for keep on saying it, but it is really important to appreciate the time scales of the different age groups of patients. So for all you young fit students out there who you will be able to tolerate an acute medical insult for quite some time, and actually interesting thinking about the COVID um, outbreak that we have at the moment, it's not until day seven or even day 10 when the younger patients are coming in uh, quite poorly and needing intensive care. And that's because they have the physiological reserve and capacity to cope with the acute illness until they can't. And you'll find very often that younger people reach uh, a tipping point and then they need uh, rapid and intensive care therapy. Older people or those who are more frail, uh, so for example, who have uh, COPD, uh, reduced left ventricular systolic function, um, peripheral vascular disease, uh, mitral valve or aortic valve pathology. If you can imagine, if you gave their uh, cardiovascular system an insult such as sepsis or myocardial ischemia um, or uh, GI bleeding, for example, then they're obviously not going to cope as well and their blood pressure will uh, drop much more quicker. Be aware, of course, about those who have blunting of their physiological responses uh, through, sing through uh, drugs such as beta blockade. A lot of the evidence suggests that actually you can detect cardiac arrest long before they happen. A lot of studies suggest that between somewhere between 8 and 24 hours, which is a significant window for, us, for those of us that work in acute medicine to try and turn the situation around and if we can't to make appropriate escalation decisions. This is the early warning score chart here, and hopefully some of you will be familiar uh, with this from your year one. Uh, for example, I recently did the uh, year one OCAPIs, and this was one of the stations uh, was to uh, calculate someone's new score and do it properly. Uh, suffice to say, a lot of it wasn't. Just to be clear, hopefully you'll be familiar with the respiratory rate. This is the most sensitive marker of acute illness, and remember, it's always done over one minute. It's important to know that your default setting for uh, SpO2 scale should always be scale 1. It's really important that we don't put our patients on scale 2, i.e. those who are prone to oxygen sensitivity and type 2 respiratory failure without discussing this with a senior doctor. Indeed, unfortunately, there have been very serious cases where asthmatics, for example, have been put on scale 2 and as a consequence have died. When we look at air or oxygen, well, I slightly take issue with this because actually, as you can imagine, two litres via nasal specs is indeed oxygen and you'd still get a two. But 15 litres via a non breather mask, of course, is a patient who's much more critically unwell and they still get a two. Systolic blood pressure, well, you can probably um, appreciate that uh, why that there is such a wide variation uh, and that you can have a systolic blood pressure of 200 and a score of zero. Well, all blood pressures are different, and actually hypertension uh, as an isolated problem is rarely a medical emergency. Uh, and indeed, hypertensive encephalopathy, or a blinding headache, is relatively rare. 
and indeed some patients such as those who have chronic kidney disease or have had a stroke they will have very high blood pressures but actually reducing those blood pressures too far too soon will actually worsen the ischemic insult. One of the other changes in the new two scale uh, was about the introduction of alert and confused rather than ADPU which it was previously confusion is a cardinal sign of acute illness in the elderly and they should always be paid attention to again the differential will change between your younger patients and your older so for example in younger patients who have confusion you'd be much more worried about meningitis and encephalitis in older people it could be simple confusion by urinary tract infection or constipation temperature is again a fairly self-explanatory self physiological parameter uh, most of us are pretty comfortable with dealing with uh, fevers um, and such as by doing blood cultures, sputum samples, CRP, chest x and looking for signs of sepsis. However, we're not so uh, uh, keen on or at least we're not so uh, prone to recognising hypothermia as a medical emergency which could be from endocrine failure or in a frail older patient as the hypothalamus uh, wears away and is less effective and also if for example they have uh, very little in the way of fat and muscle uh, they're very quickly going to lose uh, temperature um, sorry lose heat relative to their body surface area one of the key concepts that underpins us um, who do with acute medicine and when you're clerking your patients in one of the things that I would strongly recommend you think about is your patient's trajectory of disease. This is a really powerful tool uh, which we can use to see how well our patients are doing and what the long-term prognosis is. Also gives you a rough idea of how well a patient is likely to cope with something like intensive care medicine. So for example in trajectory one as you can see there's a very sharp level uh, of decline in function and usually this will be from something like an acute major event like myocardial infarction or trauma. In trajectory 2 patients will usually function very well but there may be a very gentle decline at which, pace, uh, which time the patients may have fairly vague symptoms such as um, change in bowel habit, very very intermittent PR bleeding, a uh, small amount of weight loss uh, and then it's at that point in which there is discovery as the symptoms progress that it is something like a malignancy uh, let's say for example um, cholangiocarcinoma which is rarely symptomatic as you'll know it's one of the cardinal signs uh, diagnosis rather of painless jaundice uh, then often there is a rapid acceleration until the patient declines and dies trajectory three and four are the most common ones that you're going to see in acute medicine and in uh, for example general practice uh, so, for example, trajectory 3 would be very commonly like COPD or heart failure. The patient is already at a reduced function. Uh, for example, in COPD, uh, let's say the first decline is uh, early on in the winter where they get, let's say, haemophilus influenza. They have a decline, hospital admission, need, say, a week of steroids and takes them a couple of weeks to recover. A few weeks later goes by and the weather again gets colder, they have another exacerbation of their COPD, they have another decline in hospital admission, uh, then they have again another round of steroids, multiple courses of antibiotics, uh, an extra long hospital stay, and so their decline, uh, it continues as they go home, uh, as often these patients take weeks to recover and rarely pick up to their original level of function. Uh, and then as you can see towards the end of that trajectory there's a rapid progression in death and this may be that the patient uh, comes around to winter again uh, gets admitted with a very severe community acquired pneumonia which unfortunately initially seems to settle and then they deteriorate say from pulmonary embolism uh, and then they die in hospital trajectory four is a sort of the dwindling um, uh, trajectory this is most commonly seen in frailty and dementia and you'll notice that uh, again, these patients may have small patches or periods of time where they get relatively improvement in their function, but as they are very uh, prone individuals and very susceptible to um, simple, um, although complex, uh, declines such as a simple fall, um, uh, malnutrition, for example, those who have dementia, forgetting to eat uh, or believe that they already have. Frailty, one of my favourite subjects, is a really important uh, area of acute medicine. And it's important that when you think about frailties, that you think about assessing it in a different way. It's important that you ask what 
seem to us rather um, minor questions, but actually for frail patients are really important. So, for example, um, when we think about physical examination, well, is it that they have had a fall uh, because they have uh, age-related macular degeneration, for example? Is it that they've got poor hearing and they were running for the doorbell when they tripped and fell? Is it that they have a poor swallow after a stroke? Is it that they have what we describe as a tea and toast diet, and that's because they're depressed? Are they well hydrated? Do they have um, bowel problems or bladder? Is it that they've had an injury or they have skin problems? A uh, psychiatric exam, I often find that depression in the older person is grossly underdiagnosed. It seems we find it much more easier to diagnose urinary tract infection, even though the vast majority of UTIs are never proven, but we don't seem to be able to diagnose depression, and that's something I feel quite sad about. So is it that they need a cognitive screen, a mini mental score? Ask the patients about how they're coping at home. Just those things can be a really powerful intervention, and sometimes it can be often... Uh, that patients uh, feel much more comfortable in hospital um, and their family are away, for example, or those who have recurrent medical admissions will often describe, and I use this term uh, um, with some regret, is, is institutionalisation, where patients get very used to uh, the hospital system uh, and the amount of caregivers, and to be really honest, a lot of company. Think about the functional assessment. When you're clerking these patients in, in the emergency department, Ask what it is they can do for themselves and how do they do it. For example, there's a real difference between someone who can walk to the shops, bring their own shopping home uh, and go all the way unaided versus someone who can go shopping, but actually it's their daughter that takes them and then they go around in a wheelchair and then her daughter dr picks the patient up and drops them off home. That's So they're both, yes, well, both of those patients can do their own shopping. There's a very, very big difference into how they do their shopping. Uh, on examination and history and the history of falls, ask your patient how many falls they've had over the past six weeks to six months. Are they continent? Any sense in how many medications they're on? I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that the more medications a frail person is on, the more likely it is they're of harm. It's important to liaise with the caregivers, and often our colleagues in occupational therapy and physiotherapy will often have a detailed assessment of the home environment. Um, up here is um, some more detail about what I've said already, so some description of frailty syndrome such as falls, continence, confusion and function, activities of daily living, which is something that I would strongly recommend that you assess in all of your frail patients on admission, think about um, cognition and delirium. So moving on to the assessment of the acutely unwell. This follows an A, B, C, D, E picture. Airway, breathing, circulation, disability, or you're otherwise asking what's my patient's brain doing, uh, and exposure. The principles of A, B, C, D, E is that this is a dynamic and ongoing assessment, i.e. Uh, it might be that you have uh, an airway problem, which you then fix with a nasopharyngeal airway, for example, uh, and then you get down uh, to E, and then your patient you uh, seems to be deteriorating further and needs um, intubation and ventilation and so on. So it's a constant uh, ongoing assessment. Acutely unwell patients require constant re-evaluation. The idea of the ABCDE structure is it manages life-threatening problems first, i.e. obstructed airway is much more life-threatening compared to a rash. You want to evaluate the effects of treatment and or other interventions. So for example, if you have given oxygen, have their SATs improved? Has their hypoxia settled? Is their pattern of breathing improved? If you've given a bolus of fluid because you're concerned about sepsis, has their blood pressure improved? The ABCDE's principles also ensures effective communication and we make sure we get escalation decisions early. You want to make sure that you're safe, your patient's safe, PPE if necessary. Obviously with the COVID-19 outbreak, full PPE may be required. Ask your patient a simple question and you'll get a lot of information. Ask them how they're feeling. Ask them what brought them in. If they can uh, reply to you and say, yes, doctor, I've been uh, not feeling very well, I've got chest pain, then you know they have a patent airway, you know they have cerebral perfusion because they have given you a coherent answer um, and that they aren't particularly in respiratory distress. If they're only able to look at you uh, and seem to be in, uh, only get out a couple of words or two, like um, pain, help me, then obviously that implies significant respiratory distress. 
Failure to respond means a reduced cerebral perfusion, so if they're unconscious, you want to summon medical emergency team and seniors immediately. I often describe this as the end of the bed test or end of the bedogram. You want to just take a few seconds to look at your patient from the end of the bed. Are they comfortable? Are they distressed? Are they content? Are they concerned? What's their colour? What's their posture? Attach some monitoring, SATs probes, uh, BP cuff, check their temperature and attach monitoring if it's available. If your patient is talking to you then they have a patent airway. Obstruction would be no breath sounds at the mouth or nose. You'll often hear a lot of snoring and indeed you may well hear it either in you or get told you snore or you may uh, share a bed with someone who does and it always means partial airway obstruction. Remember folks that snoring is always pathological, it's also quite annoying but it's important actually if you do a head tilt and lift in these patients or people that snore you'll find that the snoring stops, it'll tip for you. Look for signs of obstruction. This may be paradoxical breathing or abdominal breathing. Now again, this is a terminal sign or a sign that your patient is about to go into cardiac arrest. And actually, if you see this, then if appropriate, we should be starting uh, CPR. The reason for that is that while we see paradoxical breathing, it's a sign of complete exhaustion. Cyanosis, something that you guys often mention when presenting your patients, is a really, really late sign. Uh, so these patients will need resuscitation if you ever see cyanosis. Listening for gurgling such as fluid, snoring, crowing, which might reflect laryngeal spasm. A croaking might be caused by a foreign body or laryngeal edema. Feel for how well someone is ventilating. I've listed up here the causes of airway obstruction. Uh, this diagram here shows you how to open up someone's airway by doing a head tilt chin lift or you can do a jaw thrust as also demonstrated in this picture. It's important that you apply high flow oxygen until proven otherwise that you don't need it or if there are concerns about oxygen sensitivity or uh, type 2 respiratory failure but remember even in these patients it is not hypercapnia that kills these patients it is hypoxic ventilatory failure. To use these, you attach them to the wall supply, turn the flow to 15 litres, inflate the bag and then apply to the patient. Remember, breathing is accounted at a respiratory rate of over one minute. Look for signs of respiratory distress. Are they using their accessory muscles? How well is the depth of their breathing? Cusmol's breathing is otherwise known as air hunger. It's a deep, rapid respiration, often caused by acidosis such as DKA. Chain Stokes, however, is apnea and then hypopnea, and this can be from brain stent, ischemia and cerebral injury. This is usually classically seen in patients who are being palliated. Patients, for example, who have got multiple spinal fractures, say from osteoporosis or have kyphosis, uh, again, they will, that will mean that it's much more difficult for them to uh, breathe as their spine isn't flexible. Is it that they are having difficulty breathing from abdominal distension, for example, perforation, uh, peritonitis? You want to check the trachea, percuss the chest and auscultate. I've listed up here a couple of common causes of tachypnea and bradypnea. I've put up here a summary of some of the oxygen delivery devices that you will see both in a &E and in the acute medicine unit. You can see that you have nasal cannula, uh, which can deliver a flow between one and uh, five litres. Again, you want to avoid high flow through nasal cannula as it simply just dries out the patient's nose and makes their nose very uncomfortable. Um, although it says on here 24 to 44% oxygen, um, they uh, aren't, aren't that specific and you should never ever assume that, uh, for example, two litres by nasal specs is the same as 24% oxygen. Uh, you have a non-rebreather mask, which I've shown you on the previous page. The uh, Venturi mask is where you can have flicks, fixed flow concentration devices. So, for example, blue is 24%. On the bottom, you have the ambi bag, or otherwise known as the bag valve mask. This will deliver 15, meters, uh, 15 litres per minute, and this will also be used to ventilate somebody if they weren't breathing or had a very low respiratory rate, such as in the case of heroin overdose. The circulation part of the AT assessment is covered in the tutorial called SHOCK and this will be up on Moodle as well. 
Disability is a bit of an odd word, but unfortunately it seems to fit the A, B, C, D, E. But what we're really asking is how well is my patient's brain working? You want to evaluate the CNS function and you want to do a very quick alert, confusion, voice, pain, unconscious. So, for example, if your patient's looking at you and talking to you, then they must be alert. If they have confusion, um, then you may want to prompt investigation for that. If uh, they only respond to your voice, so for example, you say, hello, Mr. Jones, how are you? Can you open your eyes? And they respond, then they are alert to voice. If they don't respond and then you now have to do a trapezius squeeze, then they're responsive to pain. If you have none of those above things, then the patient is unconscious. You want to check the pupil. So for example, uh, if they're pinpoint, if they've had, say, heroin or an, uh, an opioid overdose, are there any signs of head injury? You must, if you haven't already, measure blood glucose and temperature. You'd also want to consider a CT head. Is it that they need an LP? Are you worried about space occupying lesion? Are you worried about acute and chronic subdural hematoma, which is often seen classically and described in your books as chronic alcoholics who fall regularly? Is it toxicology? Uh, so, for example, have they had heroin, benzodiazepines, recreational drugs? Is there an antidote? You also want to consider CNS infections. Uh, there's some suggested media for you. That is the link to uh, the A2 assessment video by the Resource Council. Uh, you can either use this hyperlink or alternatively, uh, you can go onto YouTube, search Resource Council and look for the A2 assessment video. If you have any problems, uh, you can email me and I'll point you in the right direction. And finally, one of the most important aspects of acute medicine is actually the social aspects. We take in a wide variety of patients from all different backgrounds and it's important to remember that as developing and burdening professionals that you make sure that you keep your judgment value judgments in check. We deal with patients who have significant alcohol abuse, acute, chronic, they may come to the hospital because they're withdrawing. We have recreational drug users, it may be that they have uh, regular IVDUs and remember they often feel very judged so please bear that in mind when you approach these patients. Um, I try and always pursue a respect agenda with them. They I'll respect them as long as they tell me the truth and that way I give them the best care possible. It may be that they are admitted with an overdose. There may be um, super added mental health problems that are part of their organic disease. So for example, we have a patient who regularly attends hospital with paracetamol overdoses who has a, bi uh, a, a personality disorder. Some of it may be acute, some of it may be organic. So for example, um, psychosis, secondary to encephalitis, it may be functional. And what this simply means is that there's no organic cause that can be identified for their presentation. Chronic disease, as you will know from your community practice days, um, has a significant burden. Patients either feel very depressed because they are limited in what they can do uh, or what they can't do, for example, going out um, seeing family, driving anymore and so on. A lot of these patients have a depression burden and they often feel a burden to their family and to the healthcare system. Think about your travel history, for example infectious disease, again the coronavirus being quite topical, risk behaviours, uh, for example um, have they had unprotected sex, used high risk contacts, um, chem sex, something like that. Religion and faith also applies to uh, many of our patients. So as you'll know, those of you that are uh, practicing at the free, you'll know that obviously we have a large Orthodox Jewish community on our doorstep and they obviously have their own set of beliefs about their health cares. Um, unfortunately, female genital uh, mutilation is a burdening and look fairly in, uh, big part of presentations in London. Uh, always consider about abuse, coercion, human trafficking, domestic violence. These are very difficult topics um, and certainly if you are ever get concerned about these, certainly don't handle them on your own, but please do grab a senior doctor. Very often you guys, when you clerk them in, you often get very valuable information that they may, may be willing to tell you, but not, might not be willing to tell us. Sexuality, of course, is a very important thing. It's important that you are mindful um, of the uh, different sexualities that are out there and that you we don't ever ask our patients uh, or make assumptions that their partner for example is female or that they are married but it's to a woman because it could well be that they are married to a man. All carers play a major role in our patients particularly those who are frail and have dependencies. 
their carers could be family and often there can be some very tricky family dynamics to work through. It's important that where possible the patient always remains the, your central focus of care. It might be you need to contact social services, there may be a failure of social care systems. So for example, a nursing home feels no longer able to cope with the patient and simply sends them into hospital as a means of getting them to alternative accommodation. It may well be that you um, possibly identify safeguarding problems um, such as um, financial abuse of an elderly person uh, or sadly physical abuse. This is just another um, image to remind you of the epicenter of the TSD acute medical universe. Uh, and these are some of the handover pathways that you can also see. And this basically gives you a rough idea about the system uh, that is acute medicine. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. If there are any questions, please don't hesitate to email me uh, them. Sorry, email them to me at james.piper at ucl.ac.uk. I wish you all the very best. I look forward to seeing you all in person again soon. Take care.